So yeah, with that, uh, let me just get started. It's the same deal. I guess uh, someone was asking about if um, these are the same length as before. They are for now. I did uh, want to review how well people did on the motion timed assessment and potentially change it. Um, I haven't done it this time yet. Um, so let me first, uh, yeah, and I do recognize, yeah. I really, need, I really need to get caught up in grading. That's what it comes down to. Sorry. Um, so hopefully that, uh, again, knowing that this is probably a fairly tight time limit, um, uh, people are doing mostly okay. <laughs> so let me take the next 10 minutes working through this under the same time limit that you have. And with no other help other than, you know, I'm also in, in as a test student, so I don't really have any of the special access. Um, the only special access I have is I know this content much better than any student can be expected. So, anyways, with that, let me get started. Okay, that's about the time I'm starting so that I can watch and manage my time well. Yeah. Um, so I have 10 minutes and yeah, open book, no outside help, and Frankly, the, by the way, if you've taken my uh, physics 10, you will see some questions that you might remember seeing in my physics 10. I reuse some of those as my multiple choice questions. Uh, so that. Okay, C categorize list of examples of forces and not forces. Okay, so okay, so the first three are forces. That's the structure. The, the next three are supposed to be not forces. So this is an action, not a force. So not right. Push, Earth is an object, not a force. Um, push, pull, push. Okay, those are all forces. Yeah, jumping, some event, action, object. X, yeah, those are not forces. So this should be correct. Okay. Uh, choose a statement which co most correctly describes external and internal forces. Um, well, yeah, it depends on what our system is. <laughs> Let me just check the rest. Yeah. The, Rest are um, distractors like external forces. Are. So this is a kind of a tricky one. But when as you are identifying forces, what you are concerned always with the system. You don't draw the free body diagram of surrounding and whatnot. So um, okay, what is the most accurate description of role of friction in motion? Uh, friction ah prevents a sliding. Um, there are contexts where friction will be the thing that uh, gets things to move. I think I have a whole lecture video on that. So if you remember that, then you will get this right. Um, okay, question four. Um, what's an object resting on table? Most to correctly describe the forces on the object. Okay, um, so I guess its weight is like 35 newtons. Uh, but yeah, downward normal force, okay, that's wrong. Weight, um, so gravitational force of, yeah, 35 newton acts on the object. The net force is zero, yeah. There is a normal force that acts upward that pushes it up. And I think that, yeah, well, upward normal force, yeah, and the gra this part is wrong, okay. Um, 25 kilogram box is dragged on a horizontal frictionless surface by a horizontally applied force of 25 newtons. If the applied force tripled in magnitude, so 75 newtons, the normal force in box will horizontally apply, remain the same. Uh, those two are perpendicular directions. They don't affect each other. Uh, if the applied force was at an angle or uh, vertical, then yeah, normal force might change, but as you apply horizontal forces, um, so vertical forces were already at net zero, uh, gravitational force and normal force being the same. And no matter what you do in horizontal direction, doesn't affect it. So I think this set is definitely easier. Uh, so I've been watching my time and trying to go fast and, um, so if the motion one were too long, you might find that this one actually isn't. So we'll see. So it might be okay that I haven't finished the grading motion and this is set up where it is. I think it might turn out to be okay. Okay, so skydiver jumps out. Um, 
after falling for 20 seconds, reach the terminal velocity 75 meters per second before opening, opens, slows down. Weight is 400 newtons, so 40 kilograms, okay. <laughs> Just below the force, which is necessarily equal to 400 newton in magnitude. Oh yeah, there's going to be a lot of those. So this is saying the gravitational force on skydiver is 400 newtons, okay. What else? Air resistance. Um, it says she reaches terminal velocity. So at that point, air resistance is the same as gravitational force. That's why acceleration is zero. So yes, this is equal to 400 newtons. The tension force on the skydiver by the parachute cord is actually greater than 400 newtons because parachute is actually slowing the skydiver down. So the net the acceleration is upward, and the only way that that happens is if tension is greater. And air resistance on the sky... Uh, oh, necessary. Oh, I already had that, so okay. So that's it. The rest for one reason or another is either greater, less, or this one is a little bit iffy. So, okay. <laughs> Still not a license to go <laughs> waste the time. I only have like five minutes left. Uh, consider the following situation. You fill up the shopping cart that agree with fabric food items uh, on the cart. Uh, labels action, react. Okay, Newton's third law problem. The action is you push. Yeah, this is me writing to confuse you. Uh, when people say action, reaction, it's confusing. You really want to say action force and reaction force. When you do that, you see immediately what's wrong here. Um, and the, they are not describing forces in this description here. Or the first one at least is, but the second is not. Uh, actually, in this situation, you're pushing the car forward, and the reaction is the force that the car pushes you backward. That's the exact formula for um, Newton's third law. A pushes on B, B pushes on A back. That's this one. Um, yeah, and the rest are written in some kind of either um, cause and effect, which is wrong, <laughs> nothing to do with Newton's third law, or this is written in a way where the two forces that are uh, relate, they're, they're not related through Newton's third law. Okay, uh, weightlessness. Um, okay, now this here, what you have to be careful is this is like that with the zero G plane video, and I think you also had the videos of um, astronauts in. International Space Station a few weeks back. Um, there's still gravity acting on them. They uh, that's why they are moving in circles, or they're why they are accelerating downward. Um, it's uh, the our sensation of weight comes from normal force. So astronauts in orbit experience weightless. So this is wrong. That's what I'm trying to explain because they are falling to Earth. Uh, they are in free fall. Um, yeah. That already equal to gravitational acceleration. Uh, yeah, I guess that's close enough. Depending on how far away you are, the g might not be 9.8 meter per second squared. But I guess the phrase gravitational acceleration, it doesn't necessarily refer to the constant value. So I think it, as it stands, it's fine. A car is turning a corner. Traction between the road and a car is barely enough. Radius turn is increased by a three. Oh, yeah, I gotta write this out. So, the whole language about barely enough, it's uh, really, uh, it's, what it's getting at is basically this. When you work through the force implications, it comes down to, you have this expression for centripetal acceleration, V squared over R, and all that description goes down, comes down to is that this acceleration is kept constant. So if you are increasing radius by a factor of four, okay, then you can increase velocity by a factor of two because you have to square it. And then after that, they um, twice the previous speed, yeah. Okay, um, this is some friction question. Um, figures of magnitude apply the force on the block. Choose the option below which, uh, yeah, I, I don't remember this. Uh, it comes down to uh, uh, cases one, two, three are static friction forces, and case four is kinetic friction case. And in this kinetic friction case, when you work through the numbers, this is what you get. Uh, let me just 
So this is okay. One of those questions that uh, it's easier to me because I wrote the question. <laughs> I remember the exact the trick part. So here, um, when you work out the kinetic friction force, that ought to be coefficient times n, and n is 20 newton. So it's 0 0.4 times 20 newton, which will give you 8 newton. This 8 newton is less than this. So case 3 has greater friction uh, force the, that's exactly equal to 9 newton than case 4, and the rest are less. All right, I think that's all. So I, I think it, and this time I did waste a little bit of time, but I'm pretty sure, um, yeah, let me just check one, two, three, four, five. I mean, I could have also missed something, which I always joke it will be embarrassing because it will be embarrassing. But um, so I think this uh, multiple choice set might be better, partly because it contains a few calculation questions. It's usually those, oh, I guess I can show you what happens if I run out of time. Um, it automatically submits. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I think this uh, calculate, um, yeah, does about half of the question I think is uh, what I used in physics 10. So um, I think it's fine. <laughs> Give it a try. Um, I, as you can see with this example, um, even the questions that involve numbers, um, you don't actually need to do a lot of calculation. So the kind of situation where you do have to do, um, you know, apply standard strategy and all that stuff, uh, those questions I ask in the free form uh, portion. It's hard to do those as multiple choice, so I didn't, um, or I didn't do it too much. You might get an unlucky one or two question, um, but I think two things I think I... Um, yeah, let me just double check here. I think I organized this so that um, those questions are grouped at the end. Yeah. So the questions are grouped in some groups. I have first group of two questions, then the next group of four questions, and then the next group of one question, one question. And I'm pretty sure this um, last group is the one where I put all the questions that I thought, hey, is a look a little bit hard. So do watch out for your last question potentially being difficult. The one you saw was, I think, this one. Um, so this is the one I got. There's five other ones that I that can be a little bit tricky, difficult, but I deliberately put that as your very last two questions so that if somehow that's the question you spend a lot of time on, then it only loses you one point, not you know, lose, it doesn't cause you to lose time on the other questions you didn't have a chance to answer. So, so okay, so that's uh, my um, multiple choice attempt. And um, so I have 40 minutes remaining. That's probably enough to do the two free form questions um, with the time limit and everything. Um, yeah. So, so let me do that. I, I've done a version of this in for the motion perform timed assessment. Let me do that now for the forces and motion uh, timed assessment. Um, so I guess maybe I should explain this so much. Um, I'm, so, uh, so the questions that you might get in part one and the questions you might get in part two, they are different. They come from two entirely different pools. And this is how they are separated. As you look at questions in part one, you will mostly see um, only the situations that dealing with a uh, single object. Or as you draw a free body diagram, you would probably draw only one free body diagram. You will almost never have to worry about Newton's third law. Uh, you don't have to use multi-block strategy, although I do recommend it to use standard strategy. Um, so that's uh, what ought to be in question, uh, part one. You might still get like a centripetal force questions and whatnot. In part two is where you should have uh, multi-block uh, questions. Now, with these multi-part questions, some part of the question might not require you to use uh, multi-block strategy, but um, Overall, you have to be prepared to do the Newton's third law check and 
uh, go through all those uh, steps that I recommend that you do. So, so with that, uh, let me just uh, get started with uh, part one. And um, let me do this in a way that uh, models what I recommend that you do. So um, as I'm working through this, I'm going to be, maybe I need to zoom out a little more. Um, as I work through this, I'm going to be uh, keeping um, kind of my notes. And I do recommend that because these uh, 20 minutes are not a lot of time, that um, while you are working through this, uh, your work time might not be the most organized. And they don't have to be. Um, they, it's, it's, uh, uh, after you turn it in, you will have time to organize your work and turn it. So, uh, so let me model that as we go through this here. Um, so I'm going to start and note that this is the time I'm starting so that I know how much it will be, 20 minutes. All right, so answer, okay. A block of mass M is placed on horizontal plane. Okay. Um, all right, so may, I better start out with a free body diagram. So it looks like um, I have a um, so single object. So as I draw the forces, I'm going to have gravity pulling it down. And since it's not accelerating downward, there's a normal force supporting it. Uh, and it's describing this tension force. So it's another force that might contribute to the normal force. And um, assuming the block remains in contact, so with this contact force, uh, there's going to be some kind of friction force, I guess it would have to point to the left um, so that it either uh, cancel, either balances on tension force entirely horizontally or it just reduces the, the amount of acceleration. And I think for the purpose of the question, they are giving you the kinetic friction coefficient. So I think, uh, yeah, you're assuming the block will slide. Okay, so that's the free body diagram. And... Um, so because with these answer boxes, you can't actually put diagrams there, all the questions of this type that's basically asking you for free body diagram says to describe the forces. And this is the kind of description that I think uh, uh, if I were to see it, I would be happy with it. So uh, something like this. Um, the free body diagram has four forces on it, gravity. Mg uh, pointing downward, normal force, and pointing uh, upward, um, friction, or sorry, let me do tension, tension, uh, force T pointing uh, diagonally right upward, uh, same. Uh, same as the diagram shown in question and friction force at pointing horizontally leftward. Um, yeah, I think that's it. You can almost think of it like uh, so. If you so, if you look at your textbook, um, it has uh, what's called the accessibility features because uh, these contents they are um, meant to be they are to be available both to uh, uh, people who can see the actual content and people who might be relying on something like a screen re reader. So all these will have uh, like a figures here. They will have something called the alt text. Uh, there's a Wait, that's not a good example. Or is there something better? Uh, maybe. I mean, I don't want to waste too much time with this because uh, I'm using up my 20 minutes in here. Uh, let me see here. So something like this. Yeah. So in on uh, alt text for an image like this, there's this lengthy description that basically if someone were to listen to it or read the description instead of figure, they get the gist of what is in the figure. And it's the same idea here. Um, so imagine someone who can see this figure, how would you describe to them so that they have correct mental image? That's what this uh, question is asking. 
Okay, it says find the acceleration of the block, follow the standard strategy, and give your answer. In okay, so I, I'm gonna go through standard strategy. I've done step number one. Let me do step number two. So I know my acceleration is pointing this way. So my uh, my axis gotta be x and y. That's my step number two. Um, my step number three. I need to break down my forces into components. Let me break down tension into x component and the y component. And here I think uh, I'm yeah given the theta right inside the triangle already. So I have T y is equal to T sine theta. It's on the opposite side. And T x is equal to T cosine theta. This is the adjacent to the angle. Okay, that's my step number three. And oh, I'm already step, step number four. <laughs> So uh, step number four, my Newton's law equations, net force in the x direction is uh, the tension T cosine theta minus the friction force is equal to mass times acceleration. And my net force in the y direction are, um, I have a bunch of forces. Uh, I have normal force and the tension. Uh, so N plus T sine theta, and then I have mg minus mg is equal to zero. And as you look at this set of two questions, um, you should realize that you don't, uh, you should be lacking something. So let's see, you have tension. Um, so you are not given friction force. So this is an unknown. Acceleration is unknown and normal force is unknown. So you have two equations, three unknowns, that's a sign that you're not done yet. You need to go look for more equations. And I hope eventually you remember that you have this expression for friction. Friction is given by friction coefficient times the normal force. So this is your third equation that doesn't introduce any new unknown. Now you can solve for the thing. So let me do it this way. Um, I'm looking for acceleration. So I think if I use this, to eliminate, uh, how do I do it? Okay, let me use this to first eliminate friction there. Then I think uh, I can use uh, equation two to eliminate normal force in the resulting expression. So um, plugging in the friction, I get T cosine theta minus mu n is equal to M A, but now I have no more force, which I need to use this to eliminate. So solving this for normal force, I have normal force is equal to M G minus T sine theta. This is what we really mean. The tension is helping the normal force. It allows normal force to be less. Plug that in, then we get T cosine theta minus mu times M G minus T sine theta is equal to MA. Um, I guess, so I do recommend that you simplify. So let me just uh, show the simplified version. So to solve for acceleration, all you have to do is really divide out a M mass. So my acceleration is equal to, and let me just do the uh, simplification, which is I'm going to imagine this spreading minus mu. So I have a plus mu times n t. So uh, let me. I'm doing several steps of algebra here in my head. If necessary, pause the video and make sure you are following it. I have t times cosine theta plus mu sine theta. That's one part divided by n. And there's second term minus minus, and m cancels out. So I have mu times g. So this is one simplified version, as is typically the case when um, when you have um, when you have friction, the expression doesn't simplify well. That's usually the case. So a is equal to t divided by m times cosine theta plus mu sine theta uh, minus mu times g. By the way, um, if you're wondering how should you type this so that they um, 
so that you know the meaning is clearly communicated. Uh, the syntax I really recommend is the same syntax that ASCIIBeth uses. This is a math rendering thing that MyOpenMath uses, and uh, it's a kind of a it you know. So ask method syntax is it's a kind of a common convention, um, like before this whole I don't know HTML5 stuff. Um, uh, so uh, there's also another thing called the LaTeX, but that's a whole language. This is a much more simplified version. So, anyways, um, yeah. So so this would be the answer, and you should have that in and uh, be ready to attach this work to support that answer. He, I think I yeah, found acceleration. Uh, given a fixed magnitude of tension, at what angle theta should you pull the string so that acceleration of the block is the greatest? Oh, yeah, this is a fun one. And for some reason, I found that people have difficulty with it. Um, this is an optimization question. Uh, I think you've seen this a lot in calculus, given this... Uh, mathematical thing that depends on this parameter. How do you maximize it? How do you minimize it? Well, this is the uh, prototypical optimization question you might see in calculus. And the steps you follow is, okay, you take a derivative of the your function with respect to the parameter that you optim want to optimize with. And uh, you set that derivative equal to zero. That's exactly what you should do. So let me take this expression, take the derivative. So I have the coefficient times, okay, derivative here. So minus the sine theta plus mu cosine theta. And derivative here is zero because it's constant, is equal to zero. Or that's the condition I set so that I find the theta that maximizes A. And as you look at that, um, ah, so this coefficient, I can get rid of that. I can imagine multiplying through by m over t. That'll get rid of that. And uh, so I have a minus sine theta plus mu cosine theta is equal to zero. So um, I can write it this way. Uh, let me just do this rewrite. Mu cosine theta is equal to sine theta. I can imagine moving this here, divide by cosine theta. Then this is tangent theta. Oh, so I think I can, so I'm looking for theta. I can say my theta should be equal to arc tangent of mu. Yeah, I think uh, uh, that's uh, right. Yeah, so that's the angle at which you should pull. So you should pull that angle of theta, theta equal to arctan of mu. Um, and you can do a couple points. Uh, you can try out a couple points to check. If you had no friction, so if a mu was zero, you would want your answer to say that you should pull horizontally to get maximum acceleration so that you don't waste any of the pulling force on the vertical component. And, and that is in fact right. Now, as you increase mu, theta goes up. In, for mu of one, for example, theta should be 45 degrees because um, once you introduce friction that you do, gain, you do gain something out of the vertical component of tension. Your normal force goes down, which reduces your friction. All right, uh, I think, do I have four minutes? Oh, wait, seven minutes. Okay, I think that's enough time if I don't talk too much for the last bit. Um, yeah, suppose you push it downward and, oh, I wonder if I can use most of the result I have so far. So you find that at a certain angle, the block does not budge regardless of how much force you push the block. Okay, so I first had to figure out uh, what, if any part of this uh, analysis of the change. So, um, I wonder if I can just, uh, I think I can, um, let me just do it. Here. I need a kind of newly colored pen that doesn't look like anything else. Okay, maybe this, okay. Um, so I think if I just take a T, 
and replace it with a minus t that accomplishes reversing the direction of this force. And I think everything will also follow. So let me try that. When it, wherever I see t, I'm going to turn it into minus t. So wherever I see t, that becomes uh, minus t. So, um, so wherever I see minus t, that becomes plus t, uh, minus t, minus t, and plus t. So when I combine all these things, uh, I I messed up something. <laughs> what did I mess up? Oh, you know what? I, I know what I messed up. I messed up the um, direction of uh, friction force. This is where you have to be careful. So as I reverse the direction of tension, the friction will also reverse the direction because it's going to now move in the other direction. So I also have to flip the direction of friction to say, yeah, OK. Um, here I leave that alone because that's meant to be relationship about the magnitude, but this should be now plus and this should be now plus. Okay, um, I think I'm almost there. So yeah, so so what you have here now is okay. So looking at the signs, I have to and so I should have plus mu sine theta and minus cosine theta, okay. Um, and the uh, plus here. I might have said something wrong um, with the freak. But, uh, but I think I have enough to go on here, which is that um, when you look at this portion of the expression, you can make it so that this thing goes to zero. And if it did, then regardless of how large t is, let me check my time. Yeah, regardless of how large t is, if this uh, term adds up to zero, then your acceleration will be zero, as in it won't budge. So, so I think that's exactly what I'm looking for. So the this is at the condition this condition that minus cosine theta plus mu sine theta is equal to zero. That's the condition that'll give you the situation where no matter how large a force you uh no matter how large a force you push it with, it won't budge. Because basically with the increase in normal force, increase the friction will basically uh, it will leave it unable to move. So let me solve this. It says uh, mu sine theta is equal to cosine theta. So um, collecting sine theta over cosine theta into left hand side, I have sine theta over cosine theta, mu goes to the other side, one over mu. So that's equal to tangent theta. So, oh, so my theta is gonna be arctangent of one over mu. So um, theta is equal to arc tan of one over mu. Um, yeah, and I think it makes a sense if your let's say you, your mu is infinity, <laughs> or it approaches infinity, then this uh, approaches zero. So your theta can be basically close to zero, and um, you it, it, that all makes sense and. As your mu approaches zero, this argument here approaches infinity that causes this arctangent to approach 90 degrees uh, as mu uh, goes to zero. So at some finite in between value of mu, this angle should be somewhere between zero and 90 degrees. I think all that makes sense. Um, all right, let me submit it that. Um, and, you know, it doesn't, won't tell you any um, answers. By the way, uh, I had a Someone contacted me with an issue that they had, which I think it does come up in rare circumstances. That's where you have done this submission before the due time. 
and then um but you know not too much before you do time and as you're attaching work um the time passes then um i think <laughs> uh, what the person reported is that they lost the work that they were working here and my recommendation would be you shouldn't be typing your i mean uh, you shouldn't be putting a lot of time into typing things into here so if you have work like what i have here then what you really should be doing is i don't know taking a photo of it and then uploading it here that's one way to do it or um so or if it's something that you are going to type then uh, you should type it on some external program like a notepad or something so for this purpose let me do it here i think i can actually print this let me give it a try I have to print preview first. <laughs> I, I don't know what it's going to print. Okay, uh, that actually looks okay. So, um, I'm scared by the other thing that said something about the number of pages. All right, so print to PDF. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, not the best name, but uh, and I think I can attach that file here. Let's see. Review work in Gradebook. Be work. Yeah. Now I do. Um, I do not recommend that. Um, that you do exactly this i right now i'm doing it for the sake of time <laughs> but um i do think you should take time to organize so as, when i grade i'm going to do my best attempt to, to understand your work but uh something like because here this is basically scratch work i've used the same space to do different parts of work so like me um not being the person who did it might not recognize what different colors mean so um, like that would be terrible <laughs> don't do that please um so so you do want to take some time to organize your work um so i guess at this point i might just use this for part d and then just to re copy the portion for parts a b and c so that i have something to refer to for parts a b and c so, so yeah, that, that's it. This is uh, one of the, I think there are like nine questions for this part. So if you somehow got lucky and got this question, then I've done it for you. You can do basically the same thing. Um, uh, but um, hopefully, you know, you understood this. You didn't just, uh, uh, so I'm at a place where I'm happy showing some of these attempts because the question pool is large enough. You know, I don't think you should take the chance that you are going to get this question and you can watch this video and it, it's too low a chance of success. You want to study and prepare so that if you get one of the other questions that I haven't done here, then you can still do well. Okay, so with that, let me do the next question. I think I have enough time to do that. so. That as well. Let's see. Do I want to? You know, I think I. Uh, if I'm gonna do that whole printout thing, I think I do want to have a new uh, page so that I can just easily print. Uh, session part two. All right, so part two questions, I think in general, they will be harder than part one. If for no other reason that they, because they will uh, necessarily involve more than one object. Um, but I don't know if they're all that much. I did try to review the questions and get rid of any questions that, that I've used in the past that did uh, turn out to be too involved and difficult. So, um so yeah do your best <laughs> uh, one of the reasons i have only one attempt is because so that people don't um, use multiple attempts just trying to get a easier question so so yeah, yeah. 
I think in, as long as people can't game the system, I think it's all going to work out in the end. So, oh, so this is one of the questions that uh, not too difficult illustrates Newton's third law well. And um, if I may say so myself, I wrote it um, and, and um, it involves multiple bodies. So, okay, I think I got the easier question, <laughs> which might not be the good thing for you because yeah. um, you might not get this question. But let me answer this since I got it. Consider the three blocks shown. Unsuitable. Okay. Uh, for each of the questions below, keep on. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. So it says describe the forces on the free body diagram with three masses. Oh, yeah. All right. So I got to draw a free body diagram. So first, uh, let me draw them and then I will um, write up a description of them so that people who cannot see the diagram, that is me, <laughs> uh, before I look at your work, uh, can still get a good sense of uh, what they look like. So I have free body diagram of mass one, free body diagram of mass two, and free body diagram of mass three. So does it say I can ignore vertical forces? Um, All right, I, they don't say I can ignore it, so I better not. So for each of these masses, they will all have gravity pulling them down, M1G, M2G, and M3G. And they will all have normal force supporting them. And the net effect there is that uh, nothing happens in the vertical direction. And because these are frictionless, uh, neglect any friction, the normal force doesn't have any role. If there were friction, then it would have played some role, but no, not here. Okay, so let me start out with the mass one. The horizontal forces are the interesting one. Uh, M1 has a string one connected, so th there must be a tension force pointing that way. P1, okay. Now, M2 has uh, two strings attached to it, string one and string two. So it must have two tension forces, T1 to the left and T2 to the right. And mass three has one string, string two attached to it. So there must be one tension force pulling it to the left. And uh, it says oh, there's an applied force. So let me write that as well, applied force. And that's it. Uh, in this uh, particular situation, these tension forces almost act like uh, action-reaction force pairs. Uh, you can string is just a medium in which masses M1 and M2 interact, and they are, you know, they have all the other properties um, pointing in opposite directions, equal magnitude, and all that. So with that, let me, um, yeah, describe these uh, diagrams. So. Um, Let's see, uh, I'm going to kind of do the same word as the description. Um, all three uh, free body diagrams have um, forces in vertical direction that correspond to gravitational force and normal force on each block. Okay balance out to zero. Um, so that takes care of uh, 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 six forces in total. They balance out to zero as the normal force, as each normal force is equal to each gravitational force. Okay, that takes care of the vertical direction. So I can just focus on the horizontal forces. Uh, M1 uh, or FBD for M1 has one tension force, P1 uh, of uh, the string one, free body, uh, free body diagram for M uh, string one. Um, Pointing to right, free body diagram for M2 has two tension forces, 
T1 and T2 of the strings 1 and 2, uh, T1 point to left and T2 point to right. Everybody diagram for M3 has um, one tension force, T2 pointing to left and uh, apply the force F. Um, the forces labeled with the same symbol, so T1, T2, are equal in magnitude. So, yeah, that's uh, the word description of the diagram I've drawn. Kind of long, but I guess there's probably ways to write it shorter. It's a compromise. I would really much prefer to be able to see the drawings directly, but I can't. So I'm asking to write word the description, and then in case there's any room for confusion and whatnot on my part, I'm also asking you for this. So what you write here serves as your proof that what's here is something that you did within the time limit, and the attached the free body diagram help me figure out any places of ambiguity. Okay, find the tensions in strings one and two. Follow the Newton's law problem solving strategy and give your answer in terms of masses of the blocks and the magnitude of apply the force F. Did I tell you the acceleration? Oh, all right. So the I do know the apply the first set. Okay, maybe I can do it without knowing acceleration. <laughs> Let's give it a try. <laughs> so we've done step number one uh, of drawing the free body diagram. So let's do step number two of uh, uh, attaching coordinate axis. These all accelerate to the right with acceleration unknown, acceleration A. So um, they all should have a positive x axis going this way. And I'm not going to bother with the y axis because, as I said, Nothing interesting happens in that direction. Okay, uh, step number three, uh, it, I have no forces to decompose. I only have horizontal forces to worry about. And finally, step number four, I can write down my Newton's second law equations. Net force um, on S1, that will be T1, that's equal to M1 times acceleration. Net force on M2, that's going to be okay. T2 minus T1, that's going to be M equal to M2 times acceleration. And finally, the net force on M3, that's uh, uh, apply the force F minus T2 is equal to M3 times acceleration. Okay, uh, let me label some things or uh, mark some things. T1, don't know. T2, don't know and acceleration don't know and yeah i think that's all the unknown so i do have one two three equations and three unknowns i should be able to solve for it so uh, let me do this i'm going to first um use my equation one to eliminate acceleration for the from the rest of the system of equations so from equation one i get acceleration is equal to T1 divided by M1, and I'm going to plug that in for acceleration in both of my other equations. Then I'll have two equations, two unknowns, so I'll just solve that. Um, so my modified the equation two becomes T2 minus T1 is equal to M2 times, and then T1 over M1, so M2 over M1 times T1. That's my equation two prime. Equation three prime is um, F minus T2 is equal to M3. And then again, the same thing, divide by M1 times T1. Okay, um, so at this point, I think there's, um, um, so there are different ways to do it. In whatever way you do it, it ends up being kind of the same amount of work because, um, 
these unknowns occur in both equations and you want both of them. So it's not as though you can ignore one of them. I guess um, I could do something creative, which is, uh, I think I can do linear combination. So, um, so like if I just took this entire expression and just uh, added it to this entire expression, I think my T2s will cancel out. So, so let me do that. Uh, so let, uh, doing the linear combination, I end up with this. So for the left-hand side, I have F minus T1, T2 and minus T2 having canceled out. And on the right-hand side, I can factor out T1 and I have M2 over M1 plus M3 over M1, T1. Okay, let me finish solving for T1. So move this over. And when I do that, let me just modify it in place. What I have is I'll have to add plus one here, T1. And solving for T1, I get, so, you know, force F divided by this ratio of things. F divided by uh, M2 over M1 plus um, M3 over M1 plus 1. Let me make this a little bit prettier. I think if I do this, it'll be slightly prettier. I can multiply numerator and denominator by the same quantity. That is M1. Um, yeah. So, so, you know, this doesn't change anything because I'm multiplying by 1. But the resulting expression will be F times M1 divided by, and you can see now it's M1 plus M2 plus M3. M1 plus M2 plus M3. And I hope once you've written this down, then it kind of makes a sense because um, the apply the first F divided by the total mass, that intuitively is what acceleration should be. So what this is saying is it's acceleration times the mass M1, which kind of goes back to this expression here. So all, all that makes sense to me. Um, oh, now I need to solve for T2. So um, solving for T2, um, did I waste too much time I'm talking? All right, I gotta go faster. <laughs> I'm just gonna grab this expression here. So my T2 is equal to the, I'm just going to do this first. Um, M1. Sorry. I shouldn't do it so, try to do it so fast that I make mistakes. Okay, that's what it is. Um, and if I want to, it'll be 1 over M1 times M2 plus M1. Okay, uh, so times T1. Um, so T2 should be T1, all of this, uh, times this vector. You see M1's cancel out. So T2 should be just the F times M1 plus M2. Ah, that's pretty. Um, M1 plus M2 plus M3. You can almost imagine how this matches up with our intuitive field. You can look at T2 as uh, or you, you can look at T2 as being the thing that pulls both of these. So you have uh, with the T2 basically what you had for T1. F divided by total mass is acceleration. And this is the mass of the thing that's being pulled by T2. Now, is, and this is the one that I think that I really like about standard strategy. Um, as you're solving it, you didn't really uh, have to reason this all out. Uh, these results just uh, came out of the mathematical result. And one of the things that we are really trying to do in this class is help you develop um, ways to augment your intuition with uh, mathematical approaches. And um, here, I, I got this result just from math. I didn't really have to consider what the roles of the strings are. I didn't do that. But um, once I get a result, I can see that, oh, that matches with the, what I might have intuitively expected. And um, the kind of the questions that we approach with the standard st strategy, often they are easy enough that you can draw some connection between your mathematical result that maybe ignored or didn't require any intuition to um, 
uh, something that you might think intuitively. That's the kind of practice that you have to do for yourself um, to build up that particular analytical uh, pathways in your brain. <laughs> Um, okay, suppose the method, the second block is doubled, so that M2 is not twice as large, and it changes in the tension of the strings, you know, under a greater tension than before, and Y, which is under a smaller tension than before, and Y. Ah, uh, that's interesting. So I think uh, I can see what it means. Um, and it also goes to the T2 thing that I was talking about. Looking at T2, if I'm increasing M2, it's increasing both in the numerator and the denominator, but M2 is a greater percentage of the numerator than the denominator. So when I increase uh, M2, T2 is going to increase. And it kind of makes sense because uh, when I increase this mass, this total mass is increasing. So, um, so yeah. Now, the thing that's maybe a little bit takes more work to explain is why t1 according to this mathematical expression it'll be decreasing because m2 is in the denominator so you know easy wrong answer that you could give for t1 is that oh you say t1 isn't affected because it's pulling m1 it's not pulling m2 but it turns out it is affected t1 also t1 decreases and here what you have to figure out is that as m2 increases if you are keeping the force the same then the acceleration decreases. And, and that's really why T1 decreases, because it's pulling the same mass, but smaller acceleration, so smaller force needed. T2 is the more complicated one, where larger M2 does decrease acceleration. That's the this is denominator part. But it doesn't decrease it enough to counteract the fact that larger mass is being pulled. So, OK, so uh, let me answer here. Um, so according to the mathematical expressions in E, uh, T2 will increase uh, M2 in numerator. It's greater proportion than M2 in denominator. Um, and T1 will in, uh, decrease. M2 in denominator decreases um, T1. Um, this uh, makes sense as increasing M2 will decrease uh, possible acceleration with a given F. Um, and in case of T1, this uh, decrease the acceleration means, um, decrease the acceleration means um, a less force needed to accelerate M1. But for T2, because it's also pulling M2, uh, decrease acceleration does not decrease enough to decrease the required t2 if uh, m m2 increases with a limit uh, t2 will increase to the point and do the quick limit estimate here m2 approaches infinity m2 over m2 cancels out you get f T2 will increase to the point where it is equal to F, uh, and T1 will decrease to zero. And I hope that makes sense. Imagine uh, M2 is a really heavy thing that you're pulling. You have something that's attached in front of it, but it's not going to be accelerating. So all the force you're applying will basically be trying to pull M2, but it's not really accelerating. It's not being pulled. So this string will be slack. Um, so, and yeah, let me kind of stop there with, there with this mathematical result, because uh, there are ways to, you can describe these words that won't be quite right. So I want to avoid it, saying it that way. Um, okay, so let me submit an end. Uh, and yeah, that's all.
uh, it's, you know, sometimes people try to do this, like uh, dividing the force or force going through things. And that, uh, depending on context, I can get what you're trying to get at with that description. But in the end, it, uh, it's an imprecise description. And um, precision in language is important. It's, uh, um, that's, uh, from my perspective, it's the really the most challenging thing about physics that uh, you are trying to both to be um, descriptive with your words. You're not just writing down, or you shouldn't be just writing down uh, mathematical expressions. And at the same point, why? I don't know what that's doing. Um, well, hopefully it printed. We'll see. Um, so, and at the same time, while you are... Um, using word descriptions to describe things and not just uh, writing the mathematical expressions and calling it done. Uh, as you're using the words, um, you have to employ it precisely. Um, it's, I, a lot of the mistakes, either conceptual or calculational mistakes I see, often stems from when someone had a um, in imprecise or incorrect understanding or something. And that, that usually comes through in imprecise languages I hear. So let's see if it attached correctly. Yeah. And I think this work is more decent than the other one, unless it's going linearly. Uh, there's nothing in the work about um, what I wrote for part C, but then I guess I kind of wrote enough here. So for this question, this might actually be enough amount of work if that's uh, well organized enough. All right, so I think that's all. Um, thank you so much to those of you who watched the, through the end. And uh, let me know of any questions that come up and I'll be finalizing your week seven module soon, possibly even tonight, and I'll send an announcement when it's available. So with that, thank you and uh, I'll uh, say goodbye, stopping the recording here. Bye.